So uh, we'll spend some time just re recapitulating what we talked about last time. But our main goals today will be to take our understanding of what we talked about last time, which is um, a retardation coefficient, which we defined as uh, bulk density of the aquifer, the volumetric moisture content of the aquifer, and a distribution coefficient. And we would like to be able to figure out exactly how we get this value. We showed last time how we could do it in the field with a, a simple example, and we'll talk a bit about that today. Um, but we'd like to be able to get distribution coefficients. Uh, really a, an indicator of sorption, and we'll look at two different ways of doing that. Um, both kind of empirical from octanol water partition coefficients, which is just a, a characteristic of a solvent in water and how it partitions, how much uh, octanol will partition into water, and also the solubility of that MAPLE component. There's two ways of being able to figure out exactly what distribution coefficient is. Um, we'll talk about what happens to solubilities and sorption characteristics when you have more than one component in solution, Ralph's law. Um, we'll define mass removal rates to be able to talk about how quickly you can remove stuff uh, from the subsurface. Um, and we've, you've already done some of that actually in one of your assignments. And also how to use the information from retardation to calculate the, the mass that's in, in place. So those are the things that we maybe will, not maybe, we'll do today. And so to start off on the right trajectory, let's just recap exactly what we talked about in terms of the, uh, I guess, the end point of our discussion yesterday, uh, Thursday, I guess, was that we could define a retardation coefficient in terms of these parameters and a distribution coefficient and that this acts on a, the advection diffusion or dispersion equation. And we know what these individual components are. Um, a dispersive component with a second order partial differential. And the advective term multiplied by concentration gradient, DCDX. And I suppose um, we define this term here as being equal to a retardation coefficient. And if we could define, if we could divide this retardation coefficient, which is this upper term through by R, then we end up changing this relationship into something which then on the left-hand side, this whole term by definition, right, R divided by R, is just one. And so it looks exactly like the advection uh, diffusion equation where we have this term on its own multiplied through by this um, dispersion term and this advective term, but where the coefficients now are modified. And that was the key observation is that we can look at sorption as doing a couple of things. It takes stuff out of uh, solution and attaches it to the aquifer where it's static. These concentrations we're interested in are always the concentrations in the, in the liquid phase, in the aqueous concentrations. And so if some mass is removed, then the concentrations are, are dropped. But more telling than that, it does two things. It, one, retards the, uh, yeah, I guess probably, retards progress. Yes maybe delays um, advection. So it arrives later. And the other thing it does is it sharpens the front. And it probably doesn't help to do, hurt to do this diagram that we've always used. And that is that if we look at um, relative concentration going in. We have some step function that we turn this on. We have a core that we look at behavior downstream. So this would be time. This is relative concentration. 
and uh, we have some retardation curve at the tail end, again with time and relative concentration, C over C0. And if I do this in different colors for um, the unretarded case, then it does something whoops, like this. And we know that this length here in a, a, an ideal world is something like velocity, advective velocity times time, uh, but also divided through by retardation. And I suppose this term here would look like this. And this um, time here would look like So this time here, just by rearranging this term around, is going to be equal to um, length times retardation over advective velocity. Just by, these are the same equations, just rearranged. And I guess we know that isn't so. And so the idea is if, it, if this, I guess this would be for uh, R is equal to 1. And if it's uh, something different, then it might look slightly different. And that would be that this would be R greater than 1. And this would be also R greater than 1. And by the exact factor, if it's double, then it'd be twice as, as far in time before you get that, all for the same input. And I suppose the, the equivalent behaviors might be for um, a different input. I guess I can sh choose a different color. So an input that looks like this would be things that would look like this. careful what you draw I guess <laughs> um, and also uh, here as well right? so if you have a different uh, shape of the input curve you'd end up with different components and I suppose the these two things that we've mentioned here is that uh, the arrival time is delayed it takes longer to get there which when the retardation is greater than one and when it arrives, I haven't really shown that here, but these should be sharper. They should be more vertical, uh, the retarded ones, because of this effect that you're kind of suppressing the mixing, the dispersion in the system. And so equally important with this, I suppose, is that if we looked at, for instance, um, the real case where we've looked at these residence time distribution curves for reality, so I should probably note that this is an approximation. All of these. Because we know that this term here isn't always directly um, an indicator of the, arrive, the, the length traveled and the arrival time. It depends on the magnitude of, of the uh, Peclet number. So how much advection is in the system. So if it's a strongly advective flux, this is true. So I guess this is true for a Peclet number, which we define as advective velocity times length divided by dispersion. Uh, so for Peclet number, which is greater than or equal to 10, say, maybe, maybe that's a good number to use, then this is perhaps true. So for Peclet numbers uh, less than 10, then if we look at these residence time distributions, then we have to worry a little bit about it because all of a sudden, instead of being this behavior that you have, uh, which is on here, I'm going to move it up so I can write it. This is So we did these previously in terms of pore volumes, which we called T sub R. And T sub R we defined as 
the time taken, so this is t sub r, multiplied by the velocity and divided by the length. So you remember that time times velocity is the length traveled, if this is vector velocity, is just the length traveled in a given time for a given vector velocity. And that is equal to L. So in other words, this term is equal to 1 when one pore volume injected at the upstream has arrived at the downstream end of the core. And so this value of TR at 1 is when you get this sudden breakthrough. It's essentially saying that one pore, you've pushed in one pore volume that has traveled all the way down the core to the end, and now it's arrived. And we could modify this for the case of um, retarded flow just by dividing through by retardation. So in other words, if we go back to this equation here, and we note that advective velocity has to be divided through by retardation, advective velocity divided by retardation is this. For Peclet number, we can define in the same way as equal to um, advective velocity times length over dispersion, longitudinal dispersion. Dispersion should be divided by r. Advective velocity should be divided by r. And so if you do that for both of these, then dl over r is this, and v advective over r is this. And so this drops out. So it doesn't change the Peclet number. Uh, but it does change this. And so I guess what we need to note is that for we can define this curve exactly as we had before. And I don't know if I need to go back. You'll, you might remember the kind of scrappy figure. It would be at the end of um, this one here. This is the scrappy figure we're talking about, right? Poor volumes on the bottom, relative concentration on the vertical axis. And for Peclet number of 100, or for 10, which is this curve here, or for 1, which is this curve here, these are the residence time distributions. It just says that if you're looking in terms of pore volume and you have a strongly diffusive flow, in other words, the Peclet number is equal to 1, then it just arrives much earlier than the prediction would be from looking at the velocity. Because in the limit, it could be the velocity would be 0, and then you'd expect that this would never, ever arrive. So this is just saying that it arrives faster than the advective prediction would tell you. And so you can use all of the expressions that we talked about to get those curves, uh, which we won't repeat. But you can imagine that this, if I can get back to it, that this curve here would look like this for a Peclet number of 100. I think for a Peclet number of 10, it might look like this. And for, whoops, didn't want it to be straight. And for um, Peclet number of 1, it might look like this. Which means that it arrives much earlier than the prediction would be. And that's kind of an artifact. It doesn't mean that it arrives earlier in time um, in reality, but it, in this dimensionless pore volumes. It means that if you put di a diffusive substance in at the end of a core which has no velocity in it at all, it doesn't mean that it will take for in an infinite length of time to get to the core. It will be completely independent of the advection, which is zero. And so it will arrive earlier than the advective uh, prediction. Okay. So, so that kind of summarizes maybe our reason for wanting to talk about retardation. It, d it delays behavior. And so since we know that retardation is conditioned on this distribution coefficient, we might like to figure out how we can get this as a function of a couple of different ways. And it relies on an assumption. And the overarching assumption is that um, in clean, in, in aquifers which have um, organic carbon in them, then the organic carbon will provide the function of being the main uh, sink to, uh, to attach material from the aqueous form into the solid form. And so the basic idea is this, is that it's related to the fraction of organic carbon that's in the your aquifer. And so if the fraction of organic carbon is large enough, then you could imagine that sorption onto that carbon dominates 
the value of KD, the high value of KD that represents the sorptive behavior. If the fraction of organic carbon conversely is very low, then using a method that assumes that all the sorption in your aquifer is onto organic carbon is probably not going to be a very good analog of your system because it then completely neglects the sorption that can occur onto the quartz grains in the sand. And so the idea is that the methods that we'll talk about today for estimating um, uh, distribution coefficients by using these two methods only work well if we assume that all the, the sorption occurs onto carbon. And so the only cases where we should use these are cases where the fraction of organic carbon in the system is greater than a tenth of a percent because otherwise we won't get the, the right results. And if we do that, then we can calculate the um, uh, organic carbon partition coefficient as a function of the, um, or KD as a function of the organic carbon partition coefficient, where, for instance, we could define KD as equal to the organic carbon partition coefficient multiplied by the fraction of organic carbon. And this has to be not a percentage, but a decimal, right? So if it's 0.1%, then that's um, a tenth of 100, so it's a thousandth. So this would be 0 0.001. And so that would be this um, minimum value that we could use here. And so long as we can get this value somehow, then we have a way of being able to get KD. And if we know KD, then we can use that to be able to estimate uh, retardation. And therefore, you can use that to make predictions about what your plume uh, will look like. And so we will use two ways to do that. And they're just uh, recipes, if you like. And that is that we can get organic carbon partition coefficient, which we then use in this relationship here in two ways. We can either get it by um, octanol water partition coefficients, a physical property of the partitioning of octanol in water, or the solubility of the component TCE or PCE or carbon tetrachloride in water, the, the free coefficient where it's only one component there, no other competing uh, solutes. And so we'll just go through these two examples and we'll use the material from uh, Fetter. Starting off with uh, the second of these, which is just to use uh, solubility. So one uses solubility, which we'll do first, and the other uses um, octanol water. Jesus Christ, he's not going to help you. <laughs> I'm not deaf yet. <laughs> oh, I have to scrub that off the video. <laughs> Don't want to be done for blasphemy. All right, so here's the idea. So uh, if you go to Fedder, I don't know how many of you bought Fedder, but um, if you didn't, then you have it all online anyway, albeit a bit, a bit blur blurry. That all of these uh, correlations exist that define uh, octanol organic carbon or uh, partition coefficients as a function of the solubility of that particular component. And so you just need to choose the right one. And be aware of the fact that unlike all of the things I stress in fluids and everywhere else, that things should be uh, dimensionally homogeneous, these equations actually re require that you use the right units to be able to, to get the right answer. Uh, so the organic carbon partition coefficient is defined as a function of the solubility of the particular substance in water. And so if you know that, for instance, in this particular case for ethyl benzene, and the, the solubility is of 140 milligrams per liter, then if you put that in here, so 140, um, log 140 has to be something a bit bigger than 2, right? 100, log 100 is 2, log 1,000 is 3. It turns out to be um, 2.15. And so if you put 2.15 in for this particular term here, 
which is exactly this, multiplied by 0.55, subtract uh, that from 3.64, you end up getting 2.46. Uh, that's the log of the organic carbon partition coefficient. If you 10 to the exit, so you multiply 10 by f to the power 2.46, you get something between 100, which would be 2, and 1,000, which would be 3. So it ends up being 2288. Uh, and that's the organic carbon partition coefficient in milliliters per gram. And so if you know that that's 288, and then you could use that directly in here. Was it milliliters per gram? Yeah. Just need to be careful of your units. And that gives you a value of KD, which will be in the same units because this is just a fraction. So if it's 0.1% uh, in your aquifer, then this is 10 to the minus 3 to do that. Okay. So it's, that's it. The other way you can do it is by octanol water partition coefficients. Again, it's a recipe. And so if you skip to the second page here, you choose the appropriate recipe. Um, let's see if I can actually read this stuff here on the board. And so uh, here's just one of them up here. I'll blow it up. It's equal to 0.63 times uh, the octanol water partition coefficient, which gives you KOC directly. And so you need a value for the octanol water partition coefficient. And if we do it for benzene, that value is 1.92. Uh, or the log of that value is 1.92. Um, so is that right? Oh, no, no. This, this is it up here, 2.13. So the log of the octanol water partition coefficient is 2.13. And so if you 10 to the exit, 10 to the power 2.13 must equal 135, which is below here. And if you then substitute that value of uh, into here times 0 0.63, you end up with 82 point, um, 98, and if you want the, the log of that, which is the log from that particular, of the organic carbon. So this is octanol water, which is a material property that's defined. This is the uh, organic carbon partitioning, the stuff that gets sorbed onto the activated charcoal, activated carbon in place. Then it's equal to 1.92, which is the same value here. And so you could just use KOC, just as we had it before. So this would be in milliliters per gram, just as before. And we'd use it just as before in this expression here uh, to be able to get this value. So it's purely a, a method of being able to, to figure out the magnitudes of this organic carbon partition coefficient. And so the warning that comes with this is that we said you should only use it if fraction of organic carbon is less than a tenth of a percent. And the reason for that is that if it's less, and we're assuming that all the sorption is on to carbon, in the limit, if there's zero carbon in it, then that would predict once you do this multiplication of fraction of carbon, which is zero by the organic carbon partition coefficient, the sorption is going to be zero, and then for retardation is always going to be zero. But it ignores the amount that gets sorbed onto the solid grains. So what we could do is we could go back to our Borden example, which we did yesterday on, Tuesday, on Thursday, when we are talking about retardation, which I didn't really clean off, but well, maybe it's okay that I didn't clean it off. And the idea was that we had this uh, plume that was put in for a conservative species, which is chloride iron, and for non-conservative species, which is carbon tetrachloride. In two years, the uh, chloride, which was unretarded, went 57 meters. The carbon tet went half of that, roughly. And so if you do the math for retardation, it turns out that the retardation factor for this carbon tetrachloride should be a, a factor of 2, 2.5, I think it was in this particular case. And so if you use that, 
uh, if you measure the magnitude of the, I guess, uh, retardation was equal to uh, 2.42 on that previous slide. So if you manipulate this expression to rearrange it in terms of distribution coefficient, then you end up with an expression like this. And so if you calculate the distribution coefficient for carbon tetrachloride, you end up with this mag magnitude here from the field results. And that's in uh, milliliters per gram, which is something like 0.2. So that gives us a way to be able to calculate that. If we use the solubility, which we have for carbon tetrachloride um, at 805 milligrams per liter, then we can go back and we could calculate what the retardation coefficient should be for that system if we calculate it from this expression. And so this is the, the math. So solubility is 805 milligrams per liter. We put it in this expression, so log of this is going to be close to 3, I guess, right? Because it's almost 1,000, so it's actually 2.9, I suppose. Uh, we substitute that into the same expression as before, and we get a log KOC value of 2.04. 10 to the power 2.04 apparently is something like 110 uh, milliliters per gram in terms of the magnitude. And at Borden, I'm not sure whether we said it, but it's a, f a reality that the fraction of organic carbon is only about um, two one hundredths of a percent. So this is the same, not it is 0 0.0002, I guess, right? This number here. And so if you multiply this number, this is KOC. And this is a fraction of organic carbon, which is really low, right? Because it's, it's less than our threshold here. And we end up with a value of the distribution coefficient coming out of that as being 0 0.02 milliliters per gram. If we did it from the field data, we ended up with something like 0 0.2, so 10 times larger. And of course, the field data don't lie. They're the real data for that particular case. And so uh, uh, those are the true magnitudes. But what this uh, value that we have here uh, will give us is it will give us a retardation magnitude which is just much too small. And the reason for that is that it's calculated this distribution coefficient. So I guess that uh, instead of this being uh, r being equal to 1 plus 1.42, right, which is our value before, then I suppose the distribution coefficient, if it's a factor of 10 uh, smaller than this field one, then this term here would actually be 0 0.142. And so for the field value, which is this, I hear the rustling of chips. <laughs> it's okay. I don't. I don't mind. I was just. I must be in a punchy mood today. So, yeah. so um, this is the estimate, I guess. And you're probably already ahead of me. This would be one point one four two, which is. A factor of, well, it's 2.4 instead of 1.1 instead of 2.4. And so it would predict a different behavior in the field. It would predict that it was almost not delayed at all, right? It would, it would predict that the, um, the plume was almost coincident with the location of the plume uh, for the chloride. So I guess it would predict that the true chloride plume would exist somewhere right here. Uh, sorry. The, true carbon tech plume would be some, something like this. Instead of being delayed by a factor of 2.4, it's delayed by a factor of 1.1, which would be partly overlapping it. And so it's useful to be able to get the magnitudes from the system that makes sense. So beware in using that equation, that don't use it if your organic 
content is less than uh, a tenth of a percent. If you look at values for um, retardation coefficients in reality in the field, then there's some here, not very legible. Um, but these are actually plumes which are shown later on in here. Uh, I'll show you this. We'll get to this later. So this is another poorly uh, produced table out of Conan Mercer, one of the EPA uh, reference texts which is uh, actually available to you online, is that a variety of plumes uh, emanated from a bunch of different Superfund sites uh, from Ocean City, New Jersey, Mountain View, California, Sunnyvale, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, which I think is Otis Air Force Base, uh, a landfill in Ontario, again, um, uh, Silicon Valley, and maybe this is the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, the shapes of the plumes. But the magnitudes of the retardation for these uh, varies depending on the components that are present within the dissolved stream. And so you probably can't see these very well, but this is between 3, 3 5, and 3, 8. This is 12. This is 33. Uh, bromoform, chlorobenzene, trichloroethane. So the point being, that it depends on the individual components which are dissolved in the water. So a cocktail gets spilled that has multiple free phase components in it. They may be miscible with each other, but not miscible in the water. They then dissolve, and as the plume gets carried downstream, they sorb at different rates because this implies that if they have different retardation coefficients, then the KD values for each of these must also be different to each other. Right? So the KD values will vary depending on the individual solutes. And of course, that makes sense, because if we look at our way of being able to predict these behaviors through, for instance, solubility, the solubility of each of these components in water will be different as well. For TCE, it's something like uh, 1080 uh, parts per million, I think. Uh, yeah, parts per million, and it varies for different components. And so you'd expect that the distribution coefficient values for each of these would be different. And so they vary in different circumstances due to two things, the solubility of the different components and how they get retarded, and also how much uh, carbon, sorbing carbon there is within the system. And so in some cases where there's not much carbon, they're not retarded very much. In some cases where there must be carbon, then they must uniformly be retarded a fair amount because of the effects of that specifics of the aquifer, which of course is what all of the contaminants see because they go through the same aquifer. So we get some magnitudes of these, which you see are in the range between one and in the low, uh, the mid tens, right? Or I guess the mid, is it mid hundreds? No, mid tens, I suppose, 30-ish. Anything higher than that? Yeah, 20 or 30. So that between 1 and, and 30 are reasonable magnitudes for those. So the other thing that we might want to be aware of, since we've got through some of these things, is that we made the case that we can figure out what distribution coefficients and therefore figure out from these what the retardation magnitudes are. But what happens when we have multiple cocktails which are present in in, uh, in situ. And so you've probably seen Rolt's Law somewhere else in your, your past. This might be a good thing to look at for a week today, I would say. Uh, certainly one of the questions uh, in the past five years which I looked at uh, was dealing with partitioning into different components. And so Rolt's Law merely says that if you have a cocktail of multiple components, then the effective solubility of component I its effective solubility is a function of what proportion it is in the cocktail, in the free phase cocktail. And so if you know what the molecular proportion of that free phase component is in the cocktail, and you know what its individual unhindered solubility in water is, so if it's um, uh, carbon tetrachloride solubility on its own in water, you know that. And if you know the mole fraction of carbon tetrachloride along with PCE and ethanol and all the other things, then you could calculate what if its effective solubility would be in free phase in the water. And then you can figure out 
from that part dissolved in water, how much will be sorbed onto the solid. And so that's part of what we're doing. But the first part is to use Raoult's law to do this. So for multiple solutes, it's just... And so I think there's an example here from uh, Smithville, the, one of the, the real examples in your assignments. Um, and that is to look at the distribution of different components. So TCE, uh, trichlorobenzene, perchlorobenzene, or oh, PCBs rather, um, polyne polychlorinated biphenyls, I guess, PCBs, stabilizers, I guess, for high temperature systems. And the free phase components by weights are 2, 10, 50, and I guess by default 38%, so they add up to um, 100, obviously. Um, so you want to be able to figure out exactly what the, the molar fractions are. And so we can figure out the molar fractions are if we know what the molar weights of these. So if you take TCE, the molar weight is um, 131.4 grams for Avogadro's numbers, uh, for a mole of this material, so Avogadro's numbers of um, molecules in the system. And so since these all add up to 100, we can get the proportion uh, of moles that make up 100 grams of this cocktail merely di by dividing the percentage amount, number of grams as a fraction of 100 divided by the molar weight. So 2 grams divided by 131 uh, moles per gram gives you 0 0.152. If you take 10% uh, or 10 grams and divide through by 181.45, you get 0 0.0055. Uh, moles, and you do that for the other ones, uh, you get these. If you sum them up, then this number of moles plus this number of moles gives you the total number of moles in the system. And then if you take the molar fraction, the, the, the mass, the molar fraction divided by the total molar amount, then it gives you the molar fraction. And so instead of being a weight fraction of 2%, it's a mole fraction of 2.2%. They're only distributed by the by how much these are disparate from themselves. I guess if they're all the same uh, molar weights, these would all be the, in the same proportions as these percentages, but they're not. Uh, the heavier ones end up having slightly lower mole fractions because they're heavier. Um, and you use these as the percentages to multiply by the true solubilities. And so the mole fraction of TCE is 2.2%. The solubility of free phase TCE in water is 1060 milligrams per liter. And so if you multiply 2%, 2.2% by that, you end up with 23 milligrams per liter, which is the effective solubility. This is the effective solubility when it's competing with other components to get into solution in water. So, so only so many solubility sites, I guess, in water, you can think of it. And some of them, many of them are taken up by TCB. I guess most of them are taken up by the mineral oils um, for these. And so you can calculate from these exactly what the equivalent solubility would be. And so these would be the actual concentrations, the maximum possible concentrations of this, these individual compounds dissolved in water present within your system. Okay? And so you can apply that if you know the relative weight percentages to be able to calculate the molar fractions and then just multiply the molar fractions by um, the, the free phase solubility of that system. Okay? So that's figuring out exactly what the uh, concentrations would be when you're, they're com com competing. And so now, um, if you know the rate at which you can dissolve um, effective solubilities for phase I, So if, if we know the effective solubility limits, then we can perhaps make a stab at being able to figure out what mass removal rates are. Whoops. So mass removal rates, 
uh, by definition are equal to the mass divided by time. And so if you want to know the time to remove it, we can just rearrange that to be able to define this as time is equal to the total mass which is present within our system divided through by the mass removal rate. And so if we can calculate how much mass is present within our system and the rate at which it gets removed, then we can figure out exactly how long it takes to be uh, recovered. And I suppose, yeah, well, mass in place seems like we're doing it backwards, but we're not. So here's the, uh, the idea. So we could look at two different characteristics of uh, contaminants in the subsurface. You can imagine the stuff that's in the chimney, and so we've uh, drawn this figure before. Uh, surface, kind of a chimney with a pool that sits below it. And I suppose, well not I suppose, we expect to get different behaviors whether we're looking at the chimney which would have a certain amount dissolved in it like this or whether we're looking at a lens which is present within the subsurface and if it were a Dean apple, this lens would have stuff flowing on top of it and flowing below it. And if it was a distributed component here, it would just have stuff flowing through it. And so what we'll do is we'll just look at each of these two idealized cases as representative of these two features of a typical distribution of free phase material. And so for the distributed one, we can directly use this idea of mass divided through by mass rate of removal as the time taken to remove it, uh, so long as we can figure out exactly what these two components are. And so the mass which is present, we've already done this, right? It's going to be what? It's going to be equal to uh, the volume multiplied by the porosity multiplied by the saturation of the non-wetting component, I suppose, and multiplied through by the density of the non-wetting component. Right? So, dimensionless, dimensionless, meters cubed, kilograms per meters cubed gives you mass. And so you've done that. And the rate of removal uh, is just going to be equal to um, the volumetric flux. So. Mass rate of removal is going to be the volumetric flux multiplied by the concentration in water. And the volumetric flux is going to be the Darcy velocity multiplied by the cross-sectional area uh, multiplied by Cw, which is the same as the advective velocity multiplied by porosity, because we know that um, advective velocity is just Darcy velocity divided by porosity, right? Then plus times area times concentration of water. So that's the mass rate of removal. And I think that's exactly what we have here, right? Concentration of water, the area, and these two terms here together, this is just the Darcy velocity, not advective velocity. And so if we have that, we can calculate exactly how long it takes to remove. And so just to cement the idea in your minds, just to do a quick example, you've already done one of these, I think, right? Assignment four, I think, was that. If you take a soil, like meters cubed, you have some water going through, it has some hydraulic conductivity, has a hydraulic gradient of one in 100, so one meter drop in every 100 meters of flow, a 30% porosity, uh, you can do the math to look at if you look at the retention of some a dense non-aqueous fluid, in this case, PCE, 200 milligrams per liter, if it can only dissolve at 10%, because of some reasons we'll talk about later, which is a tenth of that, then you can calculate using this expression here to figure out that the time taken to remove it by dissolution, by solubilizing it, 
is a thousand years, basically. And so that merely points to the fact that a lot of the Superfund sites, which were contaminated when we didn't know much about this or didn't think much about it in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and not much after the 70s, have endured for many decades. And it's due to the fact that uh, the solubilities are so low. Even if you get reasonable um, natural remediation, natural dissolution occurring in the system. If you look at the portion that's at, at the, the saturated lenses that exist in pools um, within an aquifer, then you can also do the same math. Again, we will calculate the time taken to remediate as equal to the mass divided by the mass rate of removal but use a slightly different ge geometry. And the geometry is one of a box, which is actually a pool. So this is the pool, which has a, a height to it. And it's, if you look in plan view, you could imagine it being as uh, circular as you look down on it. So it has a length attached to it, which is LP, or a diameter attached to it, which is LP. And the idea is that, that you flow fluid across the top of this. And as you flow fluid across the bottom of this, then you have the opportunity to be able to uh, dissolve some of that material in here as it goes across. And you can calculate the uh, mass rate of removal, I guess I'd probably call this m dot, as a function of um, a uh, Yeah, as a function of characteristics of this. And so the, the features of this are, this is dispersion coefficient. In other words, the mixing of this allows you to mix uh, fluid and kind of replenish it from here by dispersion. Uh, the advective velocity, pi because it's assumed to be a round pool in, um, in plan view, and the diameter. LP is just the diameter of that. And so this equivalent dispersion coefficient would be given by our coefficient of vertical dispersion we talked about before. I guess we've called it, I think, d sub l. And so molecular diffusion, so this would typically be something like 10 to the minus 9 meters squared per second. I don't know what that is in year, but a year is something like 10 to the 5 seconds. So you can calculate that. Uh, this would be advective velocity, so whatever that is. And we said something about this being alpha transverse. Actually, we said something about the longitudinal value being something like the length of the plume divided by 10. Right? Not, not a function of any physical properties, just the size of the length of the plume. Because the idea is that as the plume gets larger, its chance of being able to find a big high conductivity fracture or flow field increases. You double the size, you double the chances of it finding a very permeable feature. And so this is a function of the material properties of the aquifer and the advective velocity. Um, I suppose, and also, this is the solubility. So I guess this is what we've called effective solubility of component I. And this is the porosity. And so if you wanted to, I guess you could check the dimensions of this. Uh, why don't I do that? So dispersion is in uh, meters squared per second. Uh, advective velocity is in meters per second. Uh, and 1 over length is in 1 over meters. So together, this is in meters squared per second squared. Square root of meters squared per second squared is meters a second. So it's a velocity um, multiplied by concentration. So this is a uh, mass per unit uh, volume. And this is uh, dimensionless, right? No dimensions. So the units of this are going to be in um, meters per second. So this is in overall, it's kilograms per meters cubed. Uh, 
times meters per second, right? That's what's left here. This is to the power half. And so it is in kilograms per meter squared per second. And so physically, I guess what it represents, if I draw this out, is if you look in plan view at this poker chip, this lens, which is this, right? This thing here. Then it's looking at the amount that comes off per unit area. And so this mass rate, ma dot, is in units of kilograms per meter squared per second. So if you multiply this by the total area of this, you get kilograms per second, a mass, mass rate, mass flux rate. So this is, strictly speaking, a mass rate of flux. So if we know the rate at which it removes, which is m sub a, and we want to calculate how long it takes to dissolve, then we just use mass divided by mass removal rate is equal to time. And so the mass is going to be equal to um, this height here, which is called hp here. It uh, doesn't figure into this. Uh, whoops. And I must be dyslexic. This should be HP. Times the prosody, times the density, times the saturation of the non-wetting fluid. Right. So the mass that's present is equal to HP, prosody, density of the non-wetting fluid, and its saturation of the non-wetting fluid. And um, this would be the mass per unit volume. And usually we'd multiply through by volume to get the total mass. But here we've just multiplied by the height because, let me just make sure that's, I'm not dividing through by this. I'm just merely making the case that this is the units of this. And so usually we multiply this mass per unit volume by a volume, which would be the product of the height of the lens and its area. But since in this, this is the mass per unit area, we'd like this also to be the mass per unit area, right? And so we don't care about that. So if we merely divide it through by this mass per unit area, then we have the time taken to uh, deplete it. So I probably have, may have confused you, so I'll just make sure that I write this out. And that is the time taken to deplete it is going to be equal to the height of the lens, the porosity in that lens, the density of the non-wetting fluid, the saturation of that non-wetting fluid, all divided through by the mass rate of removal per unit area. And so this amount here is going to be the same as this here. Because the units of this are mass, per unit, mass rate of removal per unit area. The units of this have to be mass rate of removal per unit area. So anyway, so just maybe overcomplicating things for no, no good reason. Okay. We. Um, the other thing that's interesting in this is that this says nothing about the rate at which you push fluid through this or push fluid past this. I suppose intuitively you could imagine that if this advective velocity was very big, that it didn't have much contact time with this lens, then it wouldn't be able to have enough contact time to dissolve much, and therefore the downstream concentration wouldn't be very large. And in fact, you see that. And so this little illustration here is to make that exact case. And so if you take a, a fish aquarium and you put a pool of this stuff in the bottom and you fill the rest of the aquarium up with sand and then you flow water in from upstream to downstream, 
and you measure the concentration of the water as it comes out of the downstream side, then you could plot that as a function of how quickly the fluid is coming into your tank. And so this was done by Schwiele, I guess, um, 32 years ago, is that right, in 1988, uh, to look at this. And so if you look at the velocity that you push water through there, and you look at the concentration that comes out at the other end, not surprisingly, if it goes through very slowly, has a long residence time, the, con the concentration that comes out is quite high compared to the solubility, which is something like 8%. If you put it in moving faster, the concentration comes out lower. And so as you go from faster uh, injection, you reduce the concentration as you do that. And so you can imagine that if you put it into being 0.1 of a meter a day, then this concentration might at some level approach the true solubility of the, the system. But the point is that these assumptions that we've developed here Actually, this one says something about the rate at which this occurs, right? Because if you reduce the advective velocity, you'll reduce the mass rates that are removed, and therefore you'll reduce the rate that it goes into uh, solution in the water. And so this solution does take care of that. This solution makes no suggestion about this. This suggests that everything that um, this should be able to dissolve, it should be able to dissolve to reach an equilibrium concentration in the, the water in the aquifer. And therefore, this is, I guess, a, a maximum upper bound limit of what you'd expect to evolve. You might expect that this would only come out at 10% of the amount that you'd expect it to, because it, if you went through at a very high velocity, you'd have to correct for that. And so uh, be careful in using the solutions. This one accounts for the residence time. This one does not account for the residence time and gives a, a rate which is maybe optimistic in terms of reality. Um, the other component is that, I suppose, as a function of this, if we know that the solubilities are maybe only of the order of 1,000 milligrams per liter, and if we know that the concentration coming out might only be 10% of that solubility, so 100 milligrams per liter, then that means that a small amount of free product can actually contaminate a large volume of water. And that is borne out in observations, and that is that if you look at uh, the, this rather nasty figure, which defines the shapes of these plumes, and the different components that are present, it identifies the amount of source material which occurred in each of these. And I suppose the smallest source here was half a 55-gallon drum, you know, 55-gallon drum, something you can fit a body in, I suppose, right? If you watch Ozark or something like that. Um, not very much volume. And if you look at the size of the plume that came from that, the contaminated volume was something like five, Billion, billion liters just from that. And I don't have g lengths of these plumes, but they're hundreds of meters to kilometers in size and of ir irregular shape. And it's based on the fact that um, the solubilities of these components are really quite, quite low. And so a small amount of free product can, at those very low solubilities, um, contaminate a very large volume of water. So the other thing that you might want to do is if you knew from what we've done at Borden exactly what uh, one of these plumes looked like from sampling. So if you could do an aerial view of one of these plumes and get at some locations the concentrations of the water, the, the concentrations of the components that are dissolved in the water, just like we did for uh, Borden, right? Borden was quite easy because it's a shallow aquifer. You can push capillary tubes in the ground, suck a bit of fluid out, and then get really quite accurate contours of this. It was an experimental program to look at uh, transport. But if you could do that, what you might want to be able to do is be able to calculate this magnitude of how much mass is dissolved. And it's going to be equal to 
well, we know the, the dissolved mass would be something like this. We think that the dissolved mass would be, where am I going to draw it? We would think that the dissolved mass should be equal to a volume times its effective solubility, right? And we know that the volume would be equal, to, so this would be the volume of water. And so the volume of water is going to be the volume of the aquifer multiplied by its porosity. And that multiplied by its effective uh, solubility, right? So that would give us the, the total mass. But that's not actually completely true, right? Because that's the amount that's uh, present in solution, but we expect that a certain amount will be dissolved onto the solid, which isn't moving. And so if we want to be able to calculate the total amount of uh, NAPL that's present, then we need to account for two parts. The part that's dissolved in the water, but also the part that is present in the sorbent mass. So the dissolved mass, we know, it's going to be equal to the saturation times the porosity times the volume of the aquifer. Um, sorry, I said saturation. I meant solubility. And the solubility, of course, will be the concentration that we measure in the aquifer. Uh, the porosity is the porosity. And the total volume of the aquifer is what we've called VA. So that's one part. So this is the dissolved masses, which is present. But the other part, which is present, will be the part that's stuck onto the, the solid. And that will be given by the mass of contaminant per unit mass of the aquifer, which we've called C star before, the sort of amount. The density of the, the bulk density of the aquifer, and again, the same volume of this, you know, the, the volume that's outlined here by some depth into the, into the page. And so we know when we define the value of C star, we defined it as the ratio, well, we defined it as this, but the definition of this, if you remember, was the idea is you take a, a, a beaker, you put, um, some uh, grains of sand, soil in it, you put some concentration of water in it, and you look at the equilibrium concentration you get onto the solid. You double that concentration, and you look at the equilibrium concentration on the solid, and you take that, and the slope of that curve is your isotherm. And it's basically, this is equal to 1, and this is equal to distribution coefficient, which is the same as being C star and C. So by definition, this is what this is. So if we rearrange this term to get this term in terms of C star, which is this, and we multiply this expression by porosity divided by porosity, which is 1 over 1, and substitute in here, then the expression that we, that we get here is going to be the total mass is equal to concentration, porosity, and total. I'm just rewriting this. Plus uh, KD times concentration times porosity over porosity times bulk density of the aquifer times the volume of the aquifer. And if we rearrange that in terms of some of the components, take some of the terms out, concentration can come out. I guess porosity can come out. I guess um, volume of the aquifer can come out. And then we're left with 1 plus KD density over porosity. And let me write that just as KD porosity. So I'm saying density, porosity, and distribution coefficient. And as if by magic, of course, this is retardation. 
So a kind of neat observation, I think, is that you can get the mass that's present in your aquifer just by measuring the concentrations that's present in the water and knowing what the retardation coefficient is and then multiplying by the volume, the contaminated volume of the aquifer, including the solids and the pore space and the porosity. And that allows you to get the total mass. And of course, if um, retardation is one, then there's no sorption onto the aquifer and so you would get the right value by using this expression. But if retardation is larger than one, then you'd underestimate the amount that's present in your aquifer because you wouldn't account for the stuff that's sorbed onto the solid grains. And I think that was the, the parting shot um, in terms of all the things that we've, we wanted to, uh, to talk about. Yeah, mass in place. So this is just equal to total mass is equal to uh, con measured concentration, porosity, volume of the aquifer, and retardation coefficient. And so everything fits together. And so that's perhaps all we'll do now uh, in terms of these fully saturated systems. And so we've said something about conservative systems where there's no sorption in part three. And we have some solutions for being able to look at what plumes look like in that system. Uh, we know that when we have a non-conservative system and some of the stuff gets stuck on the, the solid grains, that we can use all of those solutions as before. But we just have to use if equivalent um, properties that account for retardation in terms of hydrodynamic dispersion and advective velocities. And if we use those, we can get solutions for a conservative system. Um, we can calculate mass rates of removal. We can calculate mass rates that are present in these systems for both conservative and unconservative systems. And we've almost got to where we need to to be able to talk about what plumes will look like coming out of them, uh, how we might remediate them in terms of pushing water through them. And the final thing that we'll uh, talk about is to talk about these non-conservative systems where not only are they fully saturated with water, but where they exist above the, the Vado zone. So the final thing we'll talk about next time is uh, what happens in the Vado zone to this column, the smeared chimney that we have. If you want to use, for instance, soil vapor extraction to push warm air through the system to volatilize those components and to drag them out, uh, and how exactly would we quantify that? So that's what we'll deal with next time okay. on Thursday. All right, and questions?